this poem, our prose poem is called The Poet. So this poem slash prose poem is called The Poet. Um, some of you will probably know who it's about. I was 16 when I met her, a poet with ember red hair and an elemental stage presence. When she spoke, even softly, the air pressure changed. She was confident, clear worded, draped in scarves of vermilion and moss tones or dazzling white. She stood straight and tall, unafraid to whip the stage into a storm. I'd never met anyone like her, someone who could transform the space between poet and listener into its own complete ecosystem. Her words became the wide Alberta sky, the bow rivers swell and tumble. In the cadence of her voices rise and fall, her mantras pulsed with city lights and prairie wild, carried us from Calgary to Barcelona and back, brought us into a bright, full-toned presence. Like trees, we leaned in to listen. I was a self-conscious kid, the kind who'd grown up being called weird and now hesitated to talk about anything. I moved through life with a quiet, habitual twitchiness, craving conversation and friendship, but when anyone actually showed interest in getting to know me, I was baffled as to how to respond. I posted poems anonymously on the internet, earnest, anxious snapshots of confusion and loneliness and hope. It was easier to be honest where no one knew me, where I could thrash inside the intensity of my moods and after retreat back to detachment, pretend it never happened. I met the poet at a week-long writing camp for teenagers. It was uncanny and electrifying to see creative work as something people actually did, not in addition to their real life, but part of that life. It was strange to see a version of the world where people's thoughts and feelings mattered, where my thoughts and feelings could matter. For me, one of the defining feelings of being young was that my life hadn't started yet that no matter what happened, it didn't really count. I waited patiently and passively to become real, convinced this showed my maturity. But at the summer camp, my peers and instructors responded when I spoke. Rather than my words fading out unacknowledged, others laughed at my jokes, answered my questions. I wasn't used to be being treated like a person. Each time someone responded, I felt a jolt, not quite comfortable, yet not a bad feeling either. I was a ghost who suddenly found herself flesh and blood. Gathered around campfires and poetry readings, I wasn't waiting for my life to start. I was here. The poet crackled with that sense of reality. She talked about symbology, about tarot and labyrinths, about listening to the words and the energy within them. She showed us how to be in a space with another person and hear them. The poet's knowledge was impressive and wild, leaping from the beats to Lorca to haiku to punk rock, to ancient myth to the science of the cosmos, from spoken word to the page. But she never condescended to us, which meant she didn't coddle us either. She analyzed our poems and performances with serious attention, helped us find the gaps where our language fell or our voices faltered. It was perhaps my first experience of constructive criticism, of being treated like I had something worth saying and worth saying well. To teach in a way that can expand one's field of imagination rather than narrow it is a true gift. Good teaching is not about changing a person, but about leading them to the resources to become more truly themselves. I am forever grateful to have had an excellent teacher. Twelve years later, I am proud to call this poet my mentor, and even more proud to call her my friend. Over time, her ember red hair has shimmered into waves of white flame. Her eyes retain their intense clarity. When she speaks, be it on stage or in the quiet of a walk with her students, the deep attentiveness of poetry saturates the air. It asks us, together, to listen. Thanks, Caratis. <laughs>